Welcome everyone to today's webcast on corporate sourcing of renewable energy in Southeast Asia and Australia. I'll quickly take you through the housekeeping notes so we can maximize the time for our fantastic lineup of speakers today and include enough time for networking. My name is Alexandra Klassen. I work for the Climate Group as the Senior Impact Manager of RE100. The RE100 brings together over 260 of the world's most influential companies committed to sourcing 100% renewable electricity. I'll be your virtual host today, and we also have a team online here, reachable by chat for any questions or technical issues. The webcast has been organized by RE100 and by the Global Wind Energy Council, or GWEC, which is the industry association representing wind power in emerging markets around the world. Uh, it's also been organized in partnership with Baker McKenzie, the Global Solar Council, and the Sustainable Energy Association of Singapore. And you'll see here um, that today's edition is one part of a wider series that highlights markets across Asia where corporate demand for renewables can become a significant driver of growth. We've covered India, Taiwan, and we'll be holding the webcast on Japan on October 26th. And a few notes on navigating the uh, Hopin platform. We are now at the stage where we will be holding the webcast and roundtable, which will be followed by 10 to 15 minutes for small group discussions in the expo area in the group booths. To visit other areas of the platform, you can navigate on the left-hand side. And uh, for the small group discussions after the roundtable, you can follow uh, the queue that um, will let you know to move from the stage to the expo booth once that's ready. And once you're there, please make a very personal introduction by clicking on the blue button to share your audio and video. After the small group discussions, one-on-one -on -one networking will be open for the rest of the time, where you can be matched with another attendee uh, in the room and have a five-minute chat, and you can also choose to connect from there. We do encourage you to ask questions to any of the experts that are joining us today. So please share your questions in the stage chat box and our moderator will be aggregating them for the round table later. If you would like to see who else is in the room, you can do, uh, you can do so by going to the people tab at the top right and you can click through to someone's profile. Um, you can view their social media links, their website, send them a message and also you can invite them to have a video call with you. And moving on to the agenda, we have a um, fantastic uh, roster of experts on corporate sourcing of renewables in Southeast Asia and Australia that are joining us today. Uh, Joyce Lee, the Policy and Operations Director from GWEC, will begin with the opening remarks. And then we'll have back-to-back -back presentations from Paul Curnow and Martin David of Baker McKenzie, who will be speaking about the legal and regulatory framework for corporate VPAs across these markets. This will be followed by a presentation by Leo Wirwan, uh, and the buy side experience, focusing specifically on Google's 24 by 7 carbon free energy by 2030 initiative. Leo is the senior lead for energy strategy and global infrastructure at Google. And then Steve Bloom, who's wearing two hats, uh, one for the Smart Energy Council of Australia and the other for the Global Solar Council, will be joining these speakers in the roundtable discussion that will be moderated by Christopher England from the Sustainable Energy Association of Singapore. Uh, he's also the Managing Director of Energetics, which is a specialist solar PV installer that has been established in Singapore. We've already received some really great questions during the registration phase, so please do stay around for the discussion and for the networking. And with that, I will hand it over to Joyce. Thank you, Alex. Hello, and on behalf of the Global Wind Energy Council, I'm delighted to join Alex in welcoming you all to the third edition of our webcast series with RE100 on scaling up corporate procurement of renewable energy across the Asia Pacific. In the first two editions of this series on India and Taiwan, our speakers from the demand side, supply side, and advisory services shared their views on the huge potential and the frameworks for corporate demand in two critical high-impact markets. And now today, our speakers will discuss this important factor in the developing economies of Southeast Asia, which are facing high economic growth ahead, as well as more advanced markets like Australia, which must step up its own renewable energy targets. This year, we've seen months of industrial disruption, record low power demand, and fluctuating power and commodity prices impact energy markets around the world. And as markets now get back to business, we're also seeing a sharp return of carbon emissions to their pre-pandemic levels. 
We strongly believe that markets which enable direct procurement of clean energy can provide certainty, stability, and a stronger investment case for renewable energy deployment, enabling the necessary ramp up of wind and solar capacity to sustain a global warming pathway within two degrees. As more industrial and large energy consumers make these sustainability commitments, this growing body of demand side voices can become a powerful force to decarbonize the power sector. So a warm welcome again, and a thank you to our partners for this webcast, Baker McKenzie, Global Solar Council, and Sustainable Energy Association of Singapore. And I look forward to the dynamic presentations and discussions ahead. Thank you, Joyce. Now we're going to begin presentations by uh, looking at the available regulatory and supporting frameworks for corporate sourcing with Paul Kerna, partner at Baker McKenzie in Sydney on the Australian market, and then followed by Martin David, who's the head of projects at Baker McKenzie in Singapore, who will be speaking about Southeast Asia. I'll hand the floor to the Baker McKenzie speakers now. My name is Paul Kerno. I'm a partner here in Sydney, and I'm one of the global co-heads for renewables at Baker McKenzie. And it's my pleasure, together with my partner, Martin David, in our Singapore office, who's the head of our Asia Pacific Energy Mining and Infrastructure Industry Group, to present to you today as part of this webcast series on corporate sourcing of renewables for Southeast Asia and Australia. And so obviously there's a number of different structures for implementing corporate PPAs. Um, we see them different structures all around the world, uh, and that goes for Southeast Asia and Australia. There's a lot of differences across the markets here, as I'll talk about in a minute, given the different energy systems and the energy markets that we have across this region. But certainly we see RE100 corporates and others looking at opportunities to meet their targets within this region uh, and across certainly many Southeast Asian countries uh, and we've certainly seen a lot of activity on corporate PPAs over the past 18 months to, to, to 24 months here in Australia. But many Asian countries operate under the traditional monopoly utility market structure. And so therefore you really have to navigate the regulations because they drive the structure. And in some markets, uh, there are some limitations as to the sorts of uh, corporate PPA structures that can be done. So we'll give a quick overview on four different structures that we see uh, across the region and um, Martin will then highlight later on uh, for Southeast Asian countries and look at some of the challenges specifically for Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand and Singapore. So let's have a look at some different structures that we see across the region. And as I mentioned, obviously the different energy market structures really do drive a lot of the possibilities for how corporate PPA can be done. So across the Southeast Asian region in Australia, we see probably four different energy market structures. On the one hand, we have the vertically integrated monopoly where everything from generation through to transmission, distribution and retail uh, is owned by a state-owned uh, state monopoly. We also have an unbundled monopoly version where there's, there's an IPP model within that. So there's an ability for independent power producers to be selling to the state-owned wholesale purchasing agent. Um, and then that's obviously transmitted through to customers through the state-owned uh, uh, distribution and transmission network. We've moved through then to an unbundled limited competition model where you get, um, in addition to IPPs, some competition at the electricity utility level uh, and being able to obviously sell on to customers all the way through to the full unbundled, full competition model where you've got full disaggregation of different players in the market. And really we see in model four that sitting on top of typically a wholesale pool market. So certainly model four is what we see in Australia uh, and variations on those model, other models across the region. Now, this is important because this does drive the different structures that can be undertaken given those energy markets and the regulations that govern them. So, there's, there's, there's four main structures that we can talk about when we talk about corporate PPAs. And of course, there's many variations on these as well. So each of these will have some variations depending on the market. The first one really is uh, the, the, probably the most common across the region uh, and certainly where a lot of corporates have been doing some of the initial purchasing, which is a behind the meter direct wire PPA. 
um, for physical supply of renewables on site. The next one is a supply linked or sleeve PPA, where you are uh, wheeling the power physically through the electricity network system, but able to negotiate the PPA directly with the generator through to a virtual PPA, which is a, a financial hedge type product uh, that sits on top of wholesale pool markets like Australia and Singapore, where you um, are buying, entering the financial hedge, a contract for difference between the generator and the corporate, uh, and, the, and the, the wholesale market clear, delivers and clears that uh, electricity sale. Uh, and then the, the, the fourth structure is really where you're buying RECs only. Um, and so here, this is obviously with renewable energy certificates, the ability to unbundle the environmental attribute from the physical supply of power and to be able to purchase those RECs um, directly from projects or on a, on a market platform to help meet those targets. So just looking at those in turn and have a look at those structurally. So behind the meter, as I mentioned, is probably one of the most common. And I think given, given the power markets across the Southeast Asian region, in many cases, really the only one that's possible. So for example, in Indonesia, as Martin will talk about, um, there are limitations on being able to sell um, power as an IPP uh, over front of meter. So really behind the meter is probably one of the main options there. And so here you have a solar, typically solar could be another renewables project, but in this, let's talk about a solar energy project that would enter into a PPA with a corporate customer uh, near or on site and then have a direct private wire that would physically supply the power to that corporate for an agreed price. That may include, depending on the market, renewable energy certificates as well. And then, of course, the corporate customer still has to get the balance of its uh, of its electricity supply for its load. If there's a mismatch in the time of generation and the load or, or the project doesn't meet the full load from the electric utility, and so it still have its physical electricity supply contract for, um, for that. Now, there may be the ability to sell or deliver excess power from that project through to the grid, and that may come through the customer or it may come directly from the solar project. Um, and then there'd be an arrangement for any tariff rate, so there's a specific feed in tariff rate or other agreed tariff rate for that excess supply of power. And the last structure, which is not a physical electricity purchase arrangement, but a proxy for that, namely renewable certificate, is the REC purchasing structure. And so here we see corporates looking to help meet their targets by purchasing RECs separate from the physical supply of electricity. And of course, the, the beauty of a REC scheme is that you can unbundle the environmental attribute, in this case, the renewables um, generation from the physical supply. Uh, and this, of course, works where you might have limited renewable resources where customers load is. Um, you might not be able to physically deliver that renewable power to that corporate, or the corporate may be in a totally different country um, and want to take the benefit of RECs from, from other countries. So a lot of that, the REC trading obviously will happen within the domestic market, either through the trading platform or directly negotiated with the renewable energy project developer. And then, of course, as probably everyone's aware, we have the IREC standard, which allows for the certification of, of renewable energy projects and the creation of IRECs that can then be traded on the, on the global market. Uh, and this is certainly a way of opening up that opportunity to be buying power, renewable energy power, separate from the physical consumption of that. So I'll hand over now to, to Martin, who will take us through some country studies and look at some of the challenges for doing uh, corporate PPAs in the Southeast Asian region. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. We've chosen a selection of four South uh, East Asian countries to focus on. Uh, we've limited by time, so otherwise we could have covered other countries. So what I plan to do is to take you through each country and summarise the potential structures uh, for corporate PPAs and some of the challenges in implementing those structures. The first country is Indonesia. There are three stru common structures typically used for corporate PPAs. The business area designation. This essentially is to secure the exclusive right by license to distribute and sell over a specified area. 
So essentially, the developer will supply to the corporate PPA customer. The challenge here is that the business area over the entire country is currently held by PLN, the state utility. So in order to secure the right over a designated area, you'd need PLN's approval. There are certain limited areas which are exempted from PLN, but they are, for practical purposes, not appropriate for the concept of um, for supply to corporate customers. Uh, the other issue, even if you overcome the first and you uh, manage to have a designated area, uh, you need regional parliament and governor approval to the tariff. Second structure is rentals. This is quite straightforward. Essentially, the developer uh, leases the power generation equipment to the con consumer uh, and enters into a lease arrangement uh, pursuant to which there's a rental fee payable in rupees per kilowatt hour. The challenge here is that the uh, equipment for lease, uh, for rental, is only available for domestic entities, although noting that the recent 16th economic passage and package announcement in Indonesia um, has suggested that this will be opened up 100% for foreign uh, investment and foreigners. Third structure is an inflated O&M arrangement. This is where the developer funds the construction of the, of the renewables plant and then effectively at nominal consideration gifts that plant to the consumer uh, who enters into an O&M agreement pursuant to which the developer receives a large O&M fee. Um, this has a few Drawbacks, one is uh, means that the asset is on the balance sheet of the consumer, which isn't always, uh, from a tax perspective, uh, uh, required, wanted. Second issue is the consumer then has to, as the, as the importer of record, has to obtain various licenses, et cetera, in relation to the plant. And finally, there may be tax consequences of having an inflated O&M fee. There'll be VAT on the O&M fees and super profits made by the developer um, without any correspond, maybe charged to tax and may, without the corresponding uh, depreciation expense. Second country, Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam has recently uh, produced draft legislation for a direct PPA program. Uh, this is expected to be implemented this year uh, and run until 2022. Um, its participation is limited to Jenkos with solar or wind plants connected to the grid and power consumers for industrial manufacturing. And that's important because there are strict criteria to qualify uh, under, the, uh, under this program. Structure is essentially uh, along the lines of the sleeve PPA, like Paul has described. So the Genco enters into a contract for difference with the power consumer. Uh, the Genco sells to EVN, the state utility, at a spot price, uh, and then EVN sells to a power corp and that power corporation then sells on to the consumer at the spot price plus the DPPA charge. This is a new program, so that's one of the challenges. It's still in its pilot phase. It's quite limited in terms of its allocation of megawatts, 400 to 1,000 megawatts. And as I mentioned earlier, there's stringent criteria for participation by the Genkos and consumers to be able to qualify this. Um, just to complete the picture, um, classic behind the meter, structure for corporate supplies below one megawatt. Um, the law permits the sale from rooftop solar projects to corporate customers, uh, provided the EV EVN's grid cannot be utilized, is not utilized. Um, if that's the case, then the tariff is, is free to be negotiated under the PPA. Third country, Thailand, a um, few points here. The Energy Regulatory Commission regulates the which regulates energy businesses, and therefore you need a license if you're going to sell under a corporate PPA as a generating entity. Um, however, in principle, the sale terms for the supply of uh, electricity to a corporate customer is a contractual matter subject to agreement between the parties, with the qualification that under ERC notification model electricity supply service contracts for large power units users. Um, that, that uh, notification regulates the uh, supply and the corporate PPAs from certain developers and to certain mid-size and large-size users of power. The, the concept is called protected power users. If they fall within the regulation, uh, the notification, then the <clears throat> there are certain provisions are required in the corporate PPA, typically, for example, provisions dealing with the payment terms for billing. 
if the customer is an existing customer of a state utility, either the provision or the Metropolitan Electricity Authority, then following conditions apply. The customer, the recipient of the electricity under the corporate PPA, must obtain the interconnection approval. So that's quite an addition. That's quite apart from and in addition to the licensing requirements of the generator. Uh, inter interconnection approval is granted subject to certain conditions, including a backup fee to the uh, provisional or metropolitan electricity authority. And that's based upon the sort of capacity and power generation system requirements because that there, there will, of course, be backup su support from the PEA and the MEA. Final case study, Singapore. Singapore, um, similar to US, uh, sorry, similar to Australia that Paul talked us through, fully deregulated. Um, clearly, solar is the, the only viable source of renewable given land constraints and, and the high irradiation levels. Uh, typical structure is a leasing structure, uh, on-site or off-site. Off-site PV system installed on the consumer's roof, uh, and the consumer pays for the energy generated and consumed, typically at a fixed or variable rate, with terms typically 20 to 25 years. Off-site uh, is where the, cons the consumer is unable to accommodate or doesn't want to accommodate the facilities on its roof, and therefore the supply is from uh, off-site a source or aggregated from a number of off-site sources. And there are examples in the, in the Singapore market of, of both these structures. Just to refresh on the licensing requirements, um, you, you need a generation license if you're supplying electricity uh, for installations above, uh, equal to above one megawatt, but less than 10, 10 megawatts, which are connected to the grid, the power grid. Uh, for Installations greater than 10 megawatts, whether or not connected, you still need a license, but you do not need a license if you have a small one, less than one megawatt system or between one and 10 megawatts and it's not connected to the power grid. And just a final piece of the jigsaw, um, if you wish to supply excess power into the grid, then you need to be, have market participation reg registration. So many thanks to the Baker McKenzie team for setting a really solid foundation for our roundtable discussion coming up shortly. But before that, I would like to introduce Leo Wiravan, the Senior Lead for Energy Strategy and Global Infrastructure at Google, who will be speaking uh, about 24-7 carbon-free energy by 2030. Thank you very much, Leo. At this stage, I would like to welcome back uh, the Baker McKenzie team, Paul and Martin, and invite Steve from the Global Solar Council and Smart Energy Council of Australia to join Leo on stage for a 20 minute discussion that will be moderated by Christoph from the Sustainable Energy Association of Singapore. So I'll hand it to Christoph now with the final note that questions are more than welcome and they can be submitted straight in the stage chat box. Okay, um, gentlemen, can you hear me? Yeah, good. Apologies for the delay there, trying to get used to what's going on. Very good presentations we've had. Thanks, uh, Leo, thanks, Paul, thanks, Martin, and uh, welcome, Steve. Now, we've had quite a few questions already posted in from the, the audience. So what are the operational risks uh, of entering into a corporate PPA in Australia at the national level? Well, look, they're the same as everywhere, really. Um, you've got the volatility of the marketplace. And when mm -hmm. you're taking up a PPA, you're taking up some of the risks that normally a retailer would manage for you. So you've been doing, doing it through a retailer, and all of a sudden you're taking on some of those risks. Not the whole lot, of course, and often it's done through a retailer as well. So it very much depends, a bit like uh, Paul was talking about before, about the nature of the PPA, what it is you're actually signed up to. Um, I mean, operationally... Um, if it's if it's been structured well, you shouldn't see any difference. I mean, you know, the, from from an end user point of view, you should be just uh, operating as normal. Um, but the longer term risks in this market, where you've got um, changing changing rules in the in the actual um, operation of the market itself, when you've got um, a rapidly transitioning market, um, it just means that you have to go into any of the uh, PPA contracts with your eyes wide open. I mean, Baker McKenzie and a whole bunch of energetics, a whole bunch of people do work in this space and you really have to know it. If you don't know it um, and don't understand what it is you're signing up to, then it's a huge operational risk, you know, because um, you're going to take on or likely take on much more risk than you really imagine you are. 
Um, but mostly about it's a hedge buyer. and safety. Sorry, what's that? Sorry. Steve, the risk is on the buyer's side or the seller's side? Uh, well, both, actually, but mostly on the buyer's side. Oh, mostly really? on okay. the buyer's side. Look, I mean, again, it depends on the structure of what it is you've signed up for. Um, and, mm -hmm. and we have a mixture in Australia. We, my understanding is there are more than 100 corporate PPAs in Australia now. It went rapidly. It was about 58, 2017, 2018, and it's, I think, now more than 100 already, um, and that's significant. And there are some who aren't very public about what they've done, I mean, as well, which is understandable. It's just a commercial contract, so there's no reason. I think one of the things you've got to... Um, you need, you need to get expert advice and trust the expert advice. I mean, that's the thing. It's, it's not a market for unwary players. And it's mm -hmm. um, um, it, the long-term bet seems okay, but you are hedging. You're getting the certainty of a fixed price or at least an understanding of part of your use because it might not be the whole of your supply. It almost almost won't be the whole of your supply, but it could be. Um, and some of them are doing them direct with a particular generator or, a, or mm -hmm. an operator. So... You know, there are wind farm contracts and solar farm or mixtures of both. Um, and when you understand your own electricity market, your own electricity use in your business, then you've got also a better understanding of what it is you're going to be dealing with. And sometimes um, it's really interesting. Um, even at the smallest level, almost nobody understands the electricity bill and almost nobody pays much attention to it. Um, maybe when it comes in... Um, but for businesses, what's interesting is two things. One, if you make savings on that, it's direct to your bottom line. It's a net of tax saving, and it's and it's a re it's like energy efficiency. It's a, a bottom line saving, so it's a really valuable thing. And if you have a look at it in a, in a, a marketplace of corporates, whatever their operating margins are, I mean, if you go to somebody and say, well, how many, how much, how much um, gross sales, how many gross sales, or what gross revenue? Do you have to get to make that amount of money? And the multiplier is often huge, right? Mm -hmm. It looks like a small amount in their total business. You know, the energy might only be 3 or 4 or 5% of their business or maybe more. But if you can halve that and then you say, well, what, what do I have to do to sell? What do I have to sell and how much would I have to sell to make that money into my bottom line? Then the numbers can make sense. So I've sort of ranged a little bit wide there, but look, at um, there's certainty in in this in this space, and that's one of the things you're trying to do, particularly with renewable energy. Um, oh, thanks, Steve. Not so much certainty in the pool. Yeah. Great way of looking at it by saying what is the equivalent you have to do in your business. Thanks for that, Martin. Um, what time frame are you expecting specific markets in Southeast Asia to become deregulated enough to allow PPA? So, in yours and Paul's presentation earlier, you mentioned Singapore was one of the few fully deregulated markets. Um, I know that in Thailand, uh, we're often frustrated because the buildings cannot feed electricity back into the grid. So that makes um, things tricky, you know, weekends or now with COVID lower consumption in the building, so you could fail. Maybe some insight as to when you think uh, those other markets will step up to the plate, please. Okay. Can you hear me before I speak? Yes. We can. Okay, I, I think a few points. I think um, it's not necessarily the case that um, you need deregulation to have a corporate PPA, of course. Um, so that's the first point I'd make. Um, I mean, you see uh, corporate PPAs, the meter, obviously corporate PPAs exist uh, already in Vietnam, um, in Thailand, but your point is, I think, well made, is when you want a fully sort of liberalized market, you then have all the manner of sort of derivative type structures that you see in Australia. Um, so I think in terms of the countries in Southeast Asia, there is a, a clear path to deregulation in Vietnam. Um, I, I, on my presentation, you saw that the DPPA um, law has been uh, introduced. It hasn't yet come into play for the pilot direct PPA arrangements. Um, that is sort of stepping stone the next level of uh, deregulation following on from that will be um, in 2000, I think 2024, there's uh, expecting to be liberalization in the Vietnam market. Um, it'll a lot depend on how the pilot scheme in Vietnam unfolds, uh, but that's a stepping step in the right direction. So time frame wise, I think in the next 
uh, five years, I think we'll see some progress in terms of Vietnam, which is obviously a very hot market for um, investors. Um, the other country which I thought might be worth mentioning is Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia is embarked on uh, the uh, sort of deregulation process, uh, splitting up TNB into into the sort of three components of um, generation, uh, transmission, and uh, distribution. And uh, that I think is slightly delayed because of the uh, the reorganisation has taken longer than was expected. But I think again, in the same sort of time frame, we would see that um, that sort of taking place. So the next sort of five years, we'll see some progress in terms of deregulation in um, Malaysia. Perhaps a little follow-up question there, David. Do you, uh, Martin, do you see? Um, on the one hand, you've got countries wanting to meet certain Paris COP commitments. On the other hand, you've got national utilities who tend to resist people feeding into the grid. Is the national target going to help push the utilities to relax their constraints? Uh, sounds like a political question more than a, a legal question. Uh, my, uh, my, my, my suspicion is if you say take a country like Indonesia, where the there is a clear monopoly on on distribution transmission with PLN, do I see the pressure of of the Paris Agreement and the pursuit of zero carbon um, making PLN um, sort of relax their commitments? And uh, the answer is that not in not in the short term. I don't. So I think a lot of it depends upon the. the the current economic position of the country. And I think Vietnam is a very good uh, contrasting example. It's it's a young population, very industrious, and it's embarked on this uh, this mission. Um, It may not be the, uh, from a a developer's perspective, the easiest country in terms of risk allocation, but I think it is pursuing an objective which will allow it to get Closer to the, um, the the emissions that it targets that it set itself. And I guess but, they're buying less, less coal from Indonesia than they used to. Yeah, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> I guess they're buying less coal than they used to from Indonesia as a result. Yeah. <laughs> so Paul, welcome back to the to the right um, stage. Just checking, you can hear me live now. Yes, I can. Thank you. All right. So I'll throw another question at you about uh, about risks. How do you see the market responding to the risk of grid delays, uh, curtailment risks, and that kind of thing in corporate PPAs? And how is that risk being allocated between generators and corporate off-takers? Yeah, thanks. So I'll, I'll probably give a few examples from Australia, but I think what this would be relevant for other markets. Um, so obviously what we're seeing, a lot of corporate buying is, is in relation to greenfield projects, and that's obviously a great thing because these PPAs are actually enablers to go off to the bank and get project financing uh, to, to take the projects forward. And I see that's really, to me, one of the really powerful things about corporate buying is it's actually bringing more projects online. Um, and so, of course, in a greenfield project, that means you are, as a corporate off-taker, making certain assumptions, when will that power be online to match, um, you know, when you want to that, that to, to kick in. And, of course, what we're seeing in Australia, and I think this happens in other markets, perhaps not as much given how much renewables has come on so quickly in Australia, but there are delays. And so what we've seen, though, is that most corporates have been able to negotiate um, some form of uh, liquidated damages, for example, what we're seeing in Australia around... Um, delays. So if there's a delay beyond a certain period, um, there'd be damages payable from the developer to the corporate to compensate. But of course, taking into account things like force majeure, um, mm-hmm. other things that are beyond beyond the reasonable control of the party. So what we're seeing is there is a, 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 you know, a recognition that, yes, there should be some damages payable if projects come Date, but if FM events get in the way, then then that's sort of shared. Um, obviously, it doesn't stop just in terms of connection. When these projects are operating, all of, all projects will have ongoing curtailment risk. Um, and I think as you see more and more renewables come into all markets across these regions, that will be a reality of all renewables. How does a grid manage intermittency um, and balancing? And so curtailment, I think, is just a, a reality of a lot of these projects. So again, what we're seeing there is, um, 
I guess it's probably fair to say most of that risk at the moment is being put on developers um, and um, although possibly also shared at least in Australia around marginal loss factors, we do see um, some sharing with corporate off-takers for that. Um, so it, I think, you know, there's a, there's a level of um, balancing there that's required because you don't want to make these corporate PPAs um, so... Um, you know, so, so onerous on the developers in terms of exposure to damages that they're not attractive and not bankable. Because coming back to my first point, you know, these PPAs are playing a really key role in getting new projects off the ground with, um, with project financing. Okay, great. Um, thanks for that. Martin, a question back to you. And in fact, one of the countries which was suffering a lot from curtailment recently was Philippines. Um, I think on your slides, you only had time for four countries and Philippines fell off there. Uh, but there's a question directly about uh, Philippine power market. We have been largely deregulated already. And Glencoe's can contract directly with large scale power customers. This is news on the Philippines that you can share with us. Uh, you're, I think you're on mute, uh, Martin. I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. Um, it's a country okay, that I've got a lot of experience on, but not so much since the so the deregulation. So my observations are probably pretty high level. Um, first of all, I think the, um, the there are issues around Wesim. Wesim is quite still quite in terms of volume. Um, I think the market is so the point is being well made that you can of course contract directly, um, but I think it's from a generator's perspective, it's there's a limited number of of credit worthy. Um, off takers in the right markets, so there tends to be a concentration around the the sort of main grid rather than uh, in the outlying islands where, of course, Western operates. So uh, it is definitely a market that is de deregulated and sort of stands out from all the other Southeast Asian economies. As, uh, but I I think it's still work in progress in terms of the the depth of the market and the and the uh, the strength of the uh, the credit position in the market. Okay, good. Uh, we still got about five minutes uh, to go, so keep the questions coming in. Um, meanwhile, back to Leo, what do you think are the key market mechanisms and regulations missing today in Southeast Asia? And I guess your experience is Singapore, Taiwan, and, uh, and Japan. Right, I think uh, these days a nice thing is at least for wind and solar, the pure EPC cost are already very competitive in those places. So if it's not attractive, it's probably due to some regulatory hurdles, or as you say, land acquisition costs. And uh, right, appreciate that coming down. Yeah. Steve, can you contrast that? Is that the same in Australia, or do you have different concerns? Look, look it's going to. This is this. Every country in the world is going to confront this. We're just a little bit ahead because we've deployed so much so fast in a fairly uh, single, narrow marketplace. And uh, I think one of the things that's really important, the two, two key issues, one, we're in a transitional phase. So when you're signing a PPA that's seven years to 10 years or that sort of period or anything, you know, in any period longer than four or five years, right, the certainty at the end of that um, I think is actually higher in many ways because you can forecast where things are heading. The uncertainty is in the early stages and that is really uh, a nerve-wracking stage. So because right now, a whole bunch of rules are being changed. If I had a plea to the regulators in Australia, and I put this to them, I have to say, in meetings, and it, it applies to regulators everywhere. During the transition phase, your changes to regulations need sunset clauses or some identified review period. Now, in Australia, where anybody can ask for a real change any time, right, There's, and, it, and it doesn't matter who you are. So, so the mechanism is sort of there, but from my point of view, from the regulator side, and that's you know the AER, AMC, AEMO should be thinking about this, and the CER as well. Uh, these are all the regulators involved in the electricity and, and gas markets. For that matter. When you when you're proposing a regulation to deal with a transition issue, um, make sure it's a transit a transitory proposal. In other words, work out what it is you're trying to achieve. Have mechanisms for testing whether it's being achieved in the period you're operating in in the next couple of years or whatever and be prepared to change it if it's not working the way you intended it to work. And, and we've, we've seen this in South Australia 
with urgent requirements. I mean, there are physical limitations that the network has to deal with. They're putting in regulations to try and deal with that. But those regulations are permanent, effectively, unless somebody asks or seeks a change. So there's a it's a, it's a mindset when you've had an industry that's been so sec- sort of um, solid and um, predictable for, you know, in Australia for at least 20 years, um, it, it, it's, it's nerve-wracking and it's, a, and, it, and it's an anxiety-making thing, but the, the regulators have to be much more flexible and openly transparent about what they're doing, why they're doing it, and how long they expect it to do and what the results might be. And just as a last rider, we're going to confront economic close-downs of coal-fired power plants way ahead of what the market is expecting, in my view, uh, simply because there are a whole bunch of things coming up about maintenance, um, you know, operations and maintenance upgrades, things that would normally happen in coal-fired plants. And when they do the numbers, they're going to do exactly what Engie did with Hazelwood. They're going to look at the numbers and say, I can spend X hundred million doing X and I've got a plant that's only going to last a little while. And by the way, there's still a carbon tax risk that I haven't confronted yet. <laughs> Or I can spend that money somewhere else doing something else. Now, AGL did it with Liddell and, did it, and did, I, in my view, did a, fairly, a pretty good job of working out what the, the alternatives might be. But there are three or four others, two in New South Wales in particular, that I think are likely to confront the same thing. Now, nobody is ready for that. And so you've actually got a moral hazard for governments because those plants are going to go, I want money to stay open. And... Um, I, I mean, no government's going to say, no, let the lights go out. <laughs> it's like the Rust Belt in the US. Um, and we saw yeah, 20 BP and Shell, as big oil companies, kind of dipped their fingers in, into PB and wind, and they got out of it again because they couldn't hack it. And now they seem to be switching with remarkable speed from their traditional oil and gas business, and they really are transitioning quite fast into renewables. So I hope they succeed. But indeed, we might see the same thing happening to a lot of coal plants and the communities that are built up around them. So it's not always an easy choice of what's happening. We're swapping an engine as we're driving down the highway. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> it's it's you know you've got, that's that's the that's the analogy. We really we're trying to swap out everything, keep the car going, and and change everything all at once. That's mm-hmm. risky, right? So. Okay, gentlemen. I think I'm getting messages here from the from Alexandra that any moment she's going to switch us over. Uh, please read your chat to figure out <laughs> how it works. But uh, until we get there, just ask for like 10, 20 seconds from each of you. Paul, can you start? No, yeah, well, I was just going to yeah, just, add a, just one comment on on Steve's point, um, which is that I think yeah, I agree. We're going to see a lot of the coal-fired generation exit earlier in Australia. And that'll happen in other markets, and that's is a direct link between corporate procurement. So the more corporate buyers of renewables, that has to come from somewhere. That means you've got to build more. That means base load coal fired generators are not going to make the same money in the wholesale markets or elsewhere, and we'll have to exit early. So to me, the more corporate buying is actually going to be a key thing that drives a lot of those early closures. Right. And of course, uh, we haven't really even discussed batteries and storage in a big way and that's really going to be essential to manage the intermittency in the long term when those prices come down uh leo is is google doing much on storage or is it is it still too early for that to be cost effective fantastic to hear it working in nevada and i'm quite envious uh, we can't see the uh the economic working in singapore martin do you have an idea of what are the specific conditions that make uh, batteries or storage at today's costs work? Um, well, I think in, to, to give you an Asian perspective, I think the reality is that uh, utilities on the conventional procurement aren't prepared to factor in the, the cost of, of the battery components, even though it's a long-term solution to the problem and you've got grid stability issues. I think at the moment the uh, the subsidised tariffs mean that they're not going to subsidise even more to uh, mm. to allow for the battery component, certainly in the Southeast Asian markets that I operate in. Okay, so it's been bad. Something is getting in the way. All right, I'm getting the message. I think we should uh, close this off here and hand it back to Alexandra. Um, and, uh, just Steve, just quickly, time. thank thank you all, and uh, I apologise. I I've got a family situation, which means I can't stay around for the networking. Um, but uh, if there are any questions or queries comes up or anybody wants to contact me through LinkedIn or somewhere, um, I'm pleased to be um, helpful if I can help anybody. So I enjoyed talking with you guys and um, have a good rest of the session. Thank you.
Thank you, Steve. Thank you. And thank you, gentlemen, as well, and also to uh, Alexandra and to uh, the GWEC organizers. Help us out. What happens from here? Hi, Christoph. Sorry about that delay. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone, we are moving to the expo booths for the small group discussions. I think everyone is being moved there now. And uh, there will be a choice between three booths. Uh, so a discussion on renewable energy in the region with uh, GWEC and, uh, and you, Christoph. Um, and then I'll be in a room with Google to talk about corporate procurement of renewable energy. And there's a Baker McKenzie room that uh, is looking at corporate sourcing frameworks and regulation. So please, everyone, do keep your uh, put your camera on ask some questions and we'll see you in the booths and i just wanted to say thank you again to all of our speakers and sponsors